After the past three years of cryptic and confusing teaser trailers, the question on everyone's lips has been, what exactly is Death Stranding? Well, now we know. And the answer is... complicated. Try it out and you'll see what I mean. The first post-Konami game from famed designer Hideo Kojima is a boldly inventive slab of sci-fi, fastidiously crafted and host to some truly breathtaking spectacles. But it's also a cross-country crawl that frequently finds itself mired in an exhausting amount of inventory management, backtracking, one-note mission design, and unprecedentedly arduous travel. Hideo Kojima may have earned his legions of fans by allowing them to be a snake, but in Death Stranding, he's asking them to be a snail. The Death Stranding in question is the name given to a cataclysmic event that only small pockets of humanity, the Monster Energy Drink Corporation, and a social media-inspired status system have survived. Thanks for your help. You are Sam Porter Bridges, a post-apocalyptic postman played by The Walking Dead's Norman Reedus. He's on a quest to reconnect the isolated remnants of civilization and save his sister, and yes, that's a ghost-detecting baby strapped to his chest. Sam is allied in this pursuit by a quirky cast of characters with even quirkier names like Hartman and Die Hardman, and opposed by the wonderfully maniacal villain Higgs, who has an appetite for both licking faces and chewing scenery. Hell, seems like a fair exchange to me. It's definitely an intriguing story setup. But if you think that playing the role of a courier makes it sound as though Death Stranding could be one continent-spanning 40-hour series of glorified fetch quests, it's because that's exactly what it is. I head west and keep on doing what you do. The vast majority of Death Stranding's 70 main story missions bear a strong resemblance to the optional side missions we've all played in countless other open world games. We'll be awaiting the next delivery. With the exception of a handful of combat oriented diversions, advancing the plot amounts to taking item X from location A to location B over and over again. Beginning scan. Have a pleasant journey. <laughs> Bridges. What makes the repetitive objective somewhat bearable is that the scorched landscape of Death Stranding is staggering in scale and rich in detail, to the point that I initially wanted to slow down and pour over every inch. And it's just as well too, because I wasn't really given any say in the matter. The opening hours are so ploddingly paced that it makes the whole thing seem like a personal attack on the speedrunning community. At this point, we're all accustomed to walking through vast game environments carrying an arsenal of weapons and items, but Death Stranding turns what's usually a fairly effortless task into a gruelling exercise in frustration thanks to what is possibly the most aggravatingly literal inventory system ever conceived in a video game. Not only does Sam's personal inventory very easily become a comically oversized Jenga tower of cases teetering on his back, but its direct influence on his balance and momentum means keeping him upright becomes the challenge. You're forced to alternate between holding the two triggers and wrestling to keep the thumbstick on an even keel, making the act of taking a short walk up a slight hill feel more like trying to push a wheelbarrow full of bricks up a flight of stairs. Slowing things down even further are the BTs, or beached things, which haunt the many rainy areas of the map. Sam is initially defenseless against these supernatural enemies and must crouch walk past them with bated breath. Encounters with BTs certainly ratchet up the tension to survival horror levels the first few times around, turning otherwise unassuming dunes into scary silent hills. But they're ultimately easy to avoid if you walk slowly enough, becoming yet another of Death Stranding's many mechanics seemingly designed purely to put the brakes on your progress. Eventually, Sam is given the weaponry to tackle BTs in their monstrous form head on. And there's no question that each face-off against these imposing threats presents an incredibly slick spectacle. Yet even when you do manage to scramble and take down one of these nightmarish beasts, your victory is often insultingly hollow. Your reward is typically a handful of crafting crystals and the onerous task of picking up any of the cargo you had been carrying. It feels like being declared the winner of a food fight, only to find out that your prize is a mop and bucket. Roughly 10 hours in, things do pick up, as Death Stranding settles into its most consistently enjoyable rhythm. In relatively quick succession, you're given tools to build roads, to flatten out predetermined stretches of the landscape, and a couple of vehicles to drive on them. These certainly help to minimize the struggle of ferrying cargo from point A to point B, 
which of course is still what you're doing for most of the time. It's also here where the combat, effectively restricted to stealth takedowns and unarmed fisticuffs up until this point, blossoms to become exponentially more dynamic. That's thanks to weapons and gadgets that are suddenly thrust upon you at a steady clip. I found that Death Stranding's Metal Gear Solid lineage became more evident once I began to infiltrate enemy camps, create confusion amidst the human highwaymen with smoke-based decoys, and use the non-lethal sticky gun to hilariously whip cargo right off their backs from afar. Combat doesn't ever quite reach the same level of flexibility as in Metal Gear Solid 5, but it does introduce a much needed sense of play amid the monotony of manual labor. But just as Death Stranding threatens to become a consistently enjoyable video game, the setting moves to a tiring mountainous area and story progress stalls once again. Vehicles become impractical in these areas, replaced by zipline structures you can build. But Sony won't let us show you those in this review, so here's an extended look at Norman Reedus showering instead. While there is some satisfaction in forging your own zipline trail over particularly rocky terrain, you're still just using them to transport boxes to some far summit outpost, only to be told to turn around and take some other boxes straight back down again. But Kojima Productions' willingness to experiment, for better or worse, is evident in all facets of Death Stranding, and its boldness is commendable. The asynchronous multiplayer component, known as the Bridge Link, shows the effects of other players on the world without ever bringing you face to face with them. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Anyway. I was particularly inspired by the cooperative way you can build, customize, and maintain structures like bridges and watchtowers. But the Bridge Link system still has its downsides. For one, assistance from linked avatars makes almost every one of Death Stranding's major boss fights shockingly easy. <laughs> Meanwhile, structures assembled by other players, while certainly helpful at times, can just as often mislead. Okay, who put this ladder here that leads to nowhere? Great, now you've upset the baby. And yet, despite all of my gripes, I still found myself being pulled westward towards Death Stranding's climax. That's mostly due to the sense of nobility that comes from rebuilding a fractured America. So what are you waiting for? We could get put us on the goddamn grid. The pioneering spirit of finding out what exactly was over the next hill. And the lure of uncovering the mysterious cause of the Death Stranding itself. Elsewhere, I was sustained by consistently sublime artistry and ingenuity, both great and small. That's not to mention all the cheeky fourth wall breaking nods and winks you'd expect from the mind behind Metal Gear. Certainly when ads for actor Norman Reedus' real-life TV show appear whenever Sam uses the toilet, it's clear that it's Kojima who's the one who's taking the piss. But you really need to work incredibly hard to enjoy a lot of it, because so much of Death Stranding feels convoluted and requires far more effort than it has any right to. Take the fast travel system. Let's say that you're here and you want to teleport to here. Well, first you need to walk all the way to here. <clears throat> Okay, let, let's speed this up a bit. Then you have to hold a button to enter Sam's private room. Now, there is a cutscene, but don't worry, you can skip it. In order to sit through a second cutscene, but don't worry, because you can skip this too. And finally, oh, wait, I forgot about this one. And finally, you can pan the camera around to find the special teleporting umbrella, which Sam is forced to keep hung on the wall of his private room instead of, oh, I don't know, carrying it on his back? It's just a thought. Ready to take the plunge? <sighs> yes, I've been ready for the past five minutes. Yeah. Certain landmark games in recent years, like The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and Red Dead Redemption 2, have managed to successfully tread the line between the rigidity of realism and the exhilaration of pure escapism. Death Stranding possesses similarly lofty ambitions, inventive ideas, and a sprawling, spectacular map, but it's all been saddled on a backbone made of repetitive mission design and arduous traversal that simply can't support its weight over the full course of the journey. 
For more on Death Stranding, check out the opening moments and our graphics comparison. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've, uh, I've kind of been holding this since the start of this review.